Ben from Google Research. Uh, and I'm Jordan, also from Google Research and the University of Maryland. In this video, I'm coming to you not just as a researcher, but also as a trivia nerd. For the last 25 years, I've been competing in and running trivia tournaments. I instigated the idea of this paper based on some crazy results we were getting on QA datasets in our research team at Google, which Jordan and I developed into the paper. And while I obviously agree with everything in the paper, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to play the role of you, the skeptical NLP community. You said you run trivia tournaments. That doesn't seem to have anything to do with NLP, does it? Are you sure? Have you ever submitted to, say, a leaderboard? Well, of course. Every self-respecting NLP researcher has. I'd argue that that's a trivia tournament. To run a trivia tournament, you commission questions, you decide on the format, rules, and things like that. Then you need to get people to play. Then you rank everybody, and you hand out a big honking trophy. I guess. That sounds a bit like a leaderboard, except for the trophy. Yeah, squad could have really taken off if they handed out a big trophy. Honestly, it's a bit of a superficial comparison, right? Like game shows and trivia tournaments for hobbyists, they don't really have the rigor and precision of actual research. Maybe in the 50s, you had this Wild West where it was all fun and games and you had these crazy cheating scandals. But trivia has become systematized, uh, particularly when it became an intercollegiate competition in the US uh, around 1977. And after that, there was a reproducibility crisis. The top teams, when they competed each, against each other, the outcomes were often pretty close to random. And in reaction to that, in the last 30 years, we've had a huge professionalization of what it means to run a good trivia tournament. Okay, so what does make for a good trivia tournament? One central practice that makes for a good trivia tournament is a thorough playtest. Make sure that your questions are challenging, but not frustrating. All right. I mean, that's actually how we got started collaborating. So when Jordan came to Zurich, I was just trying to get my research group to actually play a machine reading data set. So we were pretending to be a computer, and we were trying to answer those questions, just seeing what a computer would see. And that was actually quite frustrating. And ever since Weisenborn et al. 2017, there's been a lot of evidence that there's shortcuts in these data sets. Exactly, and shortcuts feel like cheating to a human player uh, who want to find it fun or rewarding. If we're trying to advance AI, the task should reward knowledge, recall, and reasoning. These are exactly what trigger the pleasure centers and trivia enthusiasts' brains during a playtest. Right, and one of the things that's really frustrating is if you don't get the exact name right or you're not allowed to paraphrase an answer, that's quite frustrating. And at a higher level, the metrics do matter too. So how is the trivia community dealing with that? Tournaments like leaderboards need to crown a single winner. There, there's no getting around that. But they also recognize other categories of excellence. Aimless Pluck, inspired by this, the Google Neurops Human Computer QA competition will recognize the best QA system that fits into a smaller memory footprint. Indeed, the goal of these competitions is to crown one winner. Uh, if this is going to work well, these data sets need to be discriminative. They need to consistently find the best system. NLP data sets are so big these days, surely that's enough. Sugawara et al. divides questions into hard questions and easy questions. Uh, but I think it makes more sense to divide questions three ways. You have hard questions, easy questions, and the questions that are just right. Okay, so two hard questions are the ones that no system can answer, and two easy questions are the ones that everyone gets right. So that does make sense, but what exactly characterizes this Goldilocks zone of the exactly right questions. These are the questions that are going to separate the very best system from the next best system. And so the probability of a system getting it right will be more around 0.5. Oh, so it's like Vygotsky's zone of proximal developments for humans. These are the data that will most advance research. I guess that kind of makes sense. So the more of these discriminative questions, the better? I think so. And we can quantify just how much of the data is discriminative. And let's call this rho. But it's not just difficulty that goes into making a question discriminative or not. Yeah, we, we actually saw this when we were playtesting the natural questions data set. A lot of the questions had obvious answers, and a lot of those were obviously impossible to answer. But the few cases where we could beat other playtesters, 
they really were rare, and we also realized that very often the annotations disagreed. And if you have this kind of error that correlates with whether a question is discriminative or not, this can dramatically decrease uh, your row, the proportion of discriminative questions. Right. And we actually did some simulations to see how big of a test set would you need to tease apart system differences. And spoiler alert, our current data sets may actually not be big enough. So we also have an analysis in the appendix of the paper looking at which questions actually decided, if you will, the squad leaderboard. And again, it's not clear at all that those are really discriminative or all that interesting. So thus far, we have focused on what the trivia community considers a good data set. But you know, what about the question itself? Yeah, so the first thing is that uh, the question needs to make it clear what kind of answer it's looking for. So for example, if you're looking for when something happened, do you want the year? Do you want the month in the year, month, day in year? So why not just do it like squat or natural questions and let the source text decide? So going back to what we talked about with playtesting, this can lead to uh, confusion and dissatisfaction. You could have a source document that says Napoleon was the greatest general born in the 18th century, but not too many people would be satisfied if they asked their phone, when was Napoleon born? And it answers 18th century. That's fair. Dates are one thing, but how do you deal with multiple names or abstract concepts? Okay. There it gets more complicated, but trivia questions explicitly warn against wrong answers that might tempt a player. You, you can actually see some of this come out of playtesting. Someone mistakenly answers uh, Sherlock Holmes to a question about House MD, so the editor adds a warning, this isn't what you might think it is. But that makes the questions really unwieldy. I mean, do we really need all this time-wasting disclaimer boilerplate? No, warnings were meant to be a playful additional hint uh, to the player. Most of the time it's completely removed from what the player experiences. Uh, here's another example of this. Uh, the author explicitly delineates between what's too specific, what's too general energy, and what correlated concepts potential are just wrong. Most players will never see this, but it helps make sure that those who actually know about the subject aren't penalized. Okay, but that sounds like a ton of work. I mean, do authors have to do that for every single question? No, there's a principle of focusing on the bubble. You're going to spend all that time and energy on the questions that you think are most likely going to distinguish between the best player and the second best player. All right, so for constructing a leaderboard, I guess, that means getting as many annotations as possible and really focusing on the questions that you think current systems cannot get right. But you know, what if basically the final decision really comes down to one of those questions where you can't just agree on what the right answer is? Yeah, so trivia writers are lazy and slip up like everybody else. Uh, even with the best intentions, you, you get surprising answers and mistakes are going to happen. Collegiate tournaments have a rigorous procedure for resolving disputes, but quiz shows go even further. So what about this Jeopardy question? Your surgeon could choose to take a look inside you with this type of fiber optic instrument. How did the poor sap on the September 26, 2018 episode answer that? Uh, yeah, I answered endoscope, but uh, was ruled incorrect. The smarter person standing next to you, a real doctor, gave the answer they were looking for, laparoscope. You'll see that I'm making a quizzical look in a specific direction. Ever since the Van Doren scandal in the 50s, there is a player advocate on every quiz show to make sure that players aren't cheated or cheating uh, on these shows. And there's also a sequestered set of judges who will resolve any of these sorts of disputes triggered by a player or the player's advocate. So they're not biased against NLP researchers. One can only assume that's the reason. All right, so it seems that there are issues when very easily confusable answers are actually confused by the participants. Is that the only kind of problem that comes up? Sometimes there are unspoken assumptions embedded in the question. In, in these examples, uh, there are multiple possible answers that could be correct, but the official answer key assumes that there is a single answer. 
So you're telling me that there's more than one school and more than one sport played in Michigan? Not only that, both men and women can uh, pick up a puck. Right. Both ice and field hockey, I guess. Exactly. And you might say that these answers are more notable, but that isn't always the case. Uh, Kotaro Tanaka's friendship with MacArthur, his descent against apartheid, and his role in Japan's demilitarization are arguably as important as Dalver. Both are correct and worthy of being considered the correct answer. And if we insist on only one of those being the correct answer, really all we're doing is recapitulating certain kinds of biases in our data sets. In the paper, you talk about that format called Quiz Bowl, which you say is the gold standard for trivia competitions. But we don't have time to discuss it here. Unfortunately not. Uh, but instead, maybe we could lay out a call to action, even if you don't want to go as far as adopting this crazy thing called Quiz Bowl. So, call to action one. Look at your data, play test, and talk to trivia nerds. And also, please help people to look at your data and predictions on leaderboards so we can have discussions about them. Call to action number two, reward systems that are able to do more with less. For example, in Visual QA, reward systems that can work on lower resolution images or systems that fit in a smaller memory footprint. More generally, focus on the bubble. Make sure that you have plenty of discriminative questions of high quality. Call to action three. Part of high quality questions is avoiding ambiguity. So please make sure that it's clear what information you want in an answer. And we can actually also learn from the MT community. Annual evaluations with human in the loop evaluations will help us focus on where we can and have to improve question answering. Uh, okay, that's all uh, that we could fit into our ACL talk slot, but there's more we couldn't fit in here. Please check out the paper and view an extended version online.